Yes, welcome everyone watching to the safe space where we learn how to train and feed our dogs better. And today is a highly requested topic with a world recognized veterinarian, Dr. Judy Morgan. We are going to be talking about raw feeding our dogs. This is going to be a getting started guide. So let's just jump right into it and then I'll do a little bit more of an introduction. Uh, Dr. Judy Morgan, my first hot topic question for you you is, is my dog going to get sick from salmonella if I'm feeding them raw foods? No. The chances of your dog getting sick from salmonella, if you are feeding well-sourced raw foods, are extremely slim for a couple of reasons, one of which is that our dogs and cats have a very low stomach pH, particularly the dogs. And that pH really doesn't like bacteria, and so it will kill off... A, I mean, Let's face it, our dogs go out, they eat poop, they eat roadkill, they eat some really nasty things, and they rarely get sick from it. And if we look historically at statistics for recalls and illnesses caused by pet food, there have been many people who have been made sick from salmonella in dry kibble, like in the hundreds, uh, but no raw food has ever made people sick. And if you think about it, you handle raw meat. If you're a meat eater, you handle raw meat in your kitchen every day and you use safe meat handling practices and you should do the same thing with your pet's food. So if you're washing the bowls after they're eating, washing your hands after you're preparing the food, you are not going to get salmonella from your dog licking you. You're not going to get salmonella from cleaning up your dog's stool. Um, a healthy animal is going to do really well with this. Yeah. And isn't it true that naturally dogs have salmonella present in their natural GI system. Like it's already Oh, absolutely. There. So the, the gut microbiome, which is the bacteria and fungi and viruses that live within the gut, include harmful bacteria. So many species of salmonella, many species of clostridia. And so for people, we think about um, clostridium perfringens, uh, clostridial disease, and that kills people. When you take an antibiotic, it kills off the beneficial bacteria and allows those harmful bacteria to take over. So that's one of the reasons you don't want to take antibiotics unless it's like critically needed. Um, so yeah, that the salmonella is there in the bowel all the time and we shed it, they shed it, it's in our environment. So again, a healthy immune system, you're going to do just fine. But again, remember that kibble can also contain salmonella and other bacteria. So it's it's not a kibble versus a raw thing. It's just bacteria are in our world. They're in our bodies. They're on our bodies. They're just there, good and bad. Yep. And we're going to deep dive into that a little bit more in just a moment. But next second hot topic question is, are dogs, in your opinion, are dogs designed to digest and eat and consume raw or even gently cooked foods? Well, if we look at what they're going to eat in the wild, they don't have an oven, they don't have an extruder, they don't have a microwave. There's no way they're cooking that food. There's no way they're processing that food except through their bowel with their digestion. This is what dogs have been meant to eat. And so we get the argument of evolution. Well, evolutionarily, they've changed. We haven't had enough thousands of years for their guts to change to process a kibble or a highly processed high heat cooked food because we've only had that around since mm, 1950s ish so it's been less than 100 years we need thousands of years of evolution of feeding only our dogs that sort of product in order to have any evolutionary changes. So nope, that's not what they were designed to eat. They were really designed to eat meat. They're metasauruses. Yes, they can eat vegetation. Cats are obligate carnivores. You really need to feed them meat. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so, okay. So if my dogs and myself even are not going to get sick from getting salmonella from feeding raw foods and my dogs are designed to thrive and consume on raw dog foods, then why is my veterinarian telling me that feeding a raw food or even a gently cooked food going to harm or potentially even unalive my dog? Unalive your dog. I, I, <laughs> I, I just heard that term for the first time a couple of months ago. I, and that is definitely a younger person's term, unalive. Yes, um, yes you'd be very, very sensitive with all the social like media. 
spell L word. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. I've learned the hard way. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the problem is kind of is the same as the problem with a lot of things in what we're told it's money and who's driving the car which is the big pet food industry which is very very large companies with a lot of ad spend and with a lot of influence so we have great great evidence many great studies showing that we don't get salmonella, we don't get listeria, we don't get all these things from dog, we don't get campylobacter from the dogs eating the meat. But on the CDC website, it says do not feed raw meat to animals. On the um, FDA website, they have the same statement on the AVMA, which is the American Veterinary Medical Association, and AHA, which is the American Animal Hospital Association. They all have that same statement in bold on their websites. Who funds all of these people? The veterinary industry is funded by big pharma and big pet food. And those big pet food companies are not making raw foods. The raw food companies are smaller companies. They're getting bigger and we're getting more and more of them, but they don't have the influence. And until we have that influence, we have great evidence. If, if people would actually read the scientific studies and digest the scientific studies and understand them, they would know that that is completely a bunch of hype. Yeah. Couldn't agree, couldn't agree more. So now for those of you watching, now that I have your attention, uh, I want to <laughs> deep dive into going into raw food. How do we start feeding raw dog foods? What are some common mistakes that we should avoid? But first, I just want to give more of a proper introduction to my amazing guest today, Dr. Judy Morgan, over 30 years of veterinarian experience, author, best-selling author, speaker, researcher and what I would consider an extreme pet health advocate. And you are an inspiration to me and hundreds of thousands of pet parents out there. So we are so thrilled to have you and your knowledge and experience here with us today. A uh, quick note for those of you watching as well, Dr. Judy and I worked on an actual downloadable free guide on how to get started feeding raw. It'll be linked in the description below. So if you are more of a reader or you want to have your hands on something, that's completely free for you linked below. So let's just jump into it. Dr. Judy, if you were talking to somebody who's just getting started into uh, learning about raw foods, how would we describe like what is raw dog food compared to kibble? It is made by nature and it is unprocessed versus kibble, which is highly processed. Most of the ingredients in an extruded kibble, and there are differences that we have, now we have some air dried foods and we have some baked foods. That's very different from an extruded food. So extruded food is what kind of the big kibble companies do. And um, I actually went and took a course at Kansas State University on how to formulate and make dry kibble. We had to do the entire extrusion process. Part of the problem with those extruded kibbles is one, the sourcing of the ingredients. Um, they're, they're allowed to use rendered ingredients, which are animals that were not slaughtered specifically for feed process or eating process. They were, it could be a cow that died out in the field with some unknown disease laid there in the sun for four days and then got hauled off to the rendering facility. And then basically they cook all that down and it's really gross. So that's your first heat step that is applied. And they render it at high heats because they want to kill off bacteria. The problem with that is when those bacteria die, they release endotoxins, which are toxins and they're toxic to the body and those are not destroyed by heat. Um, so then we have uh, grains that are added in. Commonly those grains have aflatoxins because the high quality grains go to human food. So the lower quality grains are going to the pet food and they are cooked at high heat. And sometimes we don't even get the whole grain. We just get the husks or the fiber or the millings that are left over after the good stuff has been taken out for human food. So all of that is then cooked together and then it is sent through the extruder, which is a high heat process. And there's a dye on the end that makes the shape of the kibble. So it's like, if you looked at a, um, I'm thinking of like the end of my 
my meat grinder or my KitchenAid mixer, it has a die on the end and it has different size holes that the stuff comes through when you're grinding it. So these could be diamond shape or round or whatever, but that goes through at a very, very high heat. And then it goes through a drying step, which is another high heat process. And then it is sprayed with fats to make it actually taste like something because it's a dry, dead ball of brown goo that is pretty tasteless because it's been cooked to death. Yeah. So then it's sprayed with fats and then it becomes rancid if it sits in storage for too long. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems. Like if you know that whole process that kibble goes through, you go, ooh. I don't really want that. Um, so versus a raw food, it's if you went out, if you raised your own animal, let's say you raised a cow or you raised chickens for meat, you have that, you take the animal to the processor, it gets slaughtered, it gets cut up into the pieces that you want. It may go to your freezer or it may go direct to your table. That's a lot less processing. So it is a fresher product. Um, it can be frozen. It can be freeze dried. Uh, it could be dehydrated, but that's a lot less processing. Freeze drying doesn't use any heat process. Freezing doesn't use any heat process. Um, dehydrating does use a low heat, but it, there is heat. So, so it's a much more natural product that hasn't gone through all those processing steps. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a really good summary. And I think just to kind of even go even more high level, it's really, when we, we talk about raw foods, we're talking about foods that are raw meat, raw organ, raw bones, uh, keyword raw on the bones that are not cooked. It's literally just mm -hmm. served as is. And we have to remember that kibble is only about a hundred years old. So right. it's, this isn't like a new kibbles, a relatively new concept. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I don't think, and I want to make this clear too, is we're not kibble shaming, right? Like I fed kibble for years up until I, I did really too, learned. before I yeah. knew any better. Yeah. So we're here to kind of share our experience in, in the latest research on this. Um, now, do you think that raw is just another fad? No, it is here to stay and it is the fastest growing uh, section of the pet food market, which is why there's so much bad press put out by the big pet food companies with all the money and the advertising dollars because they're a little concerned about the market share that's being lost to big kibble. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so, okay, so we talked about uh, the difference between raw and kibble, and we know that a raw food or a gently cooked food or even a freeze-dried food is going to be less processed than a traditional kibble. Most kibbles are extruded and cooked at extreme high temperatures, which also removes most of that moisture, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but dogs were designed to get their moisture from their food for the most part. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we, when we compare kibble, it's going to have six to eight percent moisture versus a, a raw or gently cooked diet is going to have anywhere from 72 to 85 percent moisture. That's a huge difference. And a lot of people will say to me, well, I add water to the kibble. You have to add a lot of water to get from six percent to 80 percent. That's that's huge. And uh, it's, we've done interesting studies with that where we take different kibbles and put them in a bowl of water and see how long it takes them to break down. Some of them don't break down. Um, it requires the stomach acid uh, and it requires the stomach um, enzymes and things to actually get it to break down. And if you, um, if you have a dog who vomits up their food within an hour or so after eating and they're eating kibble, it's going to come up pretty much whole and undigested because it takes, it takes a while for that to happen. Um, on the other hand, we have some kibbles that when you put them in water, they blow apart very quickly. That's not a good thing. If you have a large breed dog that might be prone to bloat, you don't want them to eat that kibble and then get a big old guzzle of water and it goes and blows up in their stomach. So that's not a good thing for them either. This is, this is not what our dogs are designed to eat. So based on your experience over 30 years in the veterinarian field, would you say it's safe to say that a dog that's eating a primarily kibble diet is probably going through chronic dehydration, at least a mild amount? Oh yeah, absolutely. And so from a Chinese medicine perspective, we have yin and yang. Yin is moisture and cooling. And so your blood that flows through your body is moisture. It moisturizes your body. And a lot of dogs that are fed kibble for their entire life, 
they end up being what we call yin deficient, which is moisture deficient. So we get that dry, crusty nose, dry, cracked pads, dry skin. It might be flaky. Their coat doesn't have that luster and shine versus dogs who are on a high moisture diet. We don't see that later in life. Um, so I basically say that a dog who is fed only kibble is running around in a chronic state of dehydration because the kibble needs moisture to be digested. And where is that moisture coming from? Well, if they're not a big drinker, that moisture is coming from their body cells. And that's not good. <laughs> Yeah, they can be highly problematic. So, okay, so we talked about uh, the, some of the benefits of a raw feeding diet, but can we go into a little bit more of why we should, from a health perspective, and honestly, maybe even behavioral, why transitioning to a more like a fresher raw food or at least gently cooked diet can be healthier for our dogs compared to a kibble? We talked about the dehydration. Um, another one we could say is that it's uh, arguably more bioavailable in terms of nutrients. The nutrients are more bioavailable, the less that they're processed. That's widely and commonly agreed upon, I think, in both the human and canine world. Mm -hmm. What are some other potential benefits? Well, from a behavioral standpoint, and again, I'm going to throw in Chinese medicine here, but a lot of behaviors that we see, um, so again, we have yin and yang. Yin is calm. It's the female side. Yang is energy. Like all, it's, I just think Jack Russell, you know, they're like all over the place. Yeah. So if you have a dog and I had this with, um, my office manager, she got a beagle puppy and she just could not get this thing trained at all. <laughs> and so like five months in, she's like, I can't house train the dog. It doesn't know anything. I can't get it to do anything. And I said, let's get this dog off kibble. And it was on a, an energetically hot kibble too. It was on a lamb and rice. And mm -hmm. I said, let, let's take this dog and put it on something that's going to cool and calm. And within three weeks, the dog was doing everything she wanted it to do. It could listen, it could focus. Um, we see we see a lot of behavior changes with these dogs that literally are too hot. So we're taking this energetically hot, high heat processed product, dehydrating their body, and then we want them to focus. But it's like throwing paper on a fire and they just, they can't. Um, so we do see behavioral changes it also has a lot to do with the microbiome. So we see a much healthier microbiome on a meat-based high moisture diet versus a high carbohydrate diet. Um, so the changes in the microbiome, there's something called the gut-brain axis. And those bacteria that are in your gut are communicating with your cells that are communicating with the brain. And when we don't provide good nutrition and we don't have a healthy gut microbiome, then the brain is off kilter as well. So there's just huge relationship there. Yeah. Sounds very similar to humans as well. So mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting parallel. So um, a couple other benefits I find is dogs that might have allergies, might oh, have yeah. sensitivities or food intolerances, because if you're feeding a, a raw food or less processed food, generally speaking, there's going to be fewer ingredients and it's not filled with vitamin synthetic packs and sprayed on fats and flavorings and colorings and dyes. Um, and it's typically lower carbohydrates, which all in my experience, and I'm sure you could agree is helpful for dogs that have chronic ear infections or itchy skin, or they're chewing on their paws. Is that something you see? Yeah. So anything synthetic, and we do have raw diets where they add synthetic vitamins and minerals as well. I'm, I'm not a fan of anything synthetic added into the the meal, I want really all of my nutrients to come from whole foods. Because when you're feeding whole foods, the body recognizes it as something natural and the body will take what it needs and use it. And then it just kind of spits out the excess. Um, with uh, vitamin mineral supplements that are added into the food first, like you said, they're, they're something, they're, if they're synthetic, the body does not recognize that as something natural. And so the body reacts to it. And that is a cause of a lot of allergies when we're feeding synthetic things. Um, when we have dyes added to the food, which are carcinogenic, by the way. Um, so dyes being added to the food, preservatives that are added into the food to make it shelf stable. Some of these kibble companies will proudly tell you that their food is shelf stable for 25 years. 
that's like feeding your dog plastic. Like who wants something that's shelf stable for 25 years? I guess if you live somewhere where you absolutely can't get anything, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of a good reason to, to do that. I had a client once who had a little three pound chihuahua and he came in and he told me he bought a 50 pound bag of dry kibble once a year. And that lasted the dog the whole year. Oh and I just about jumped out of my skin and said, okay, it's rancid. It's got storage mites. It's stale. Like, please buy little two pound bags for your <laughs> tiny little chihuahua. So if you are a kibble feeder, please buy bags that you're going to go through in about four weeks. Keep it in the original bag. It has that kind of coating in the bag to keep it fresh, seal it up after every time you open it and then take the whole bag and put it in a container. Don't take it out of the bag. Don't yeah. store it in plastic. Don't store it in high heat. Don't store it in sunlight. Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that. I'm glad you shared that because I had a video on TikTok and Instagram go viral talking about the importance of storing the food in the bag airtight and only buying a bag that will last up to four weeks, just as you said, which I probably learned from you. And <laughs> and if people were just, they didn't had no idea, so I think I that's a huge huge tip. Um, and because the bags are designed, the bags are designed to help preserve the nutrients and keep it from going rancid. And once you open it, it starts to oxidize. So anyways, um, so thinking about, um, raw food before we jump into kind of how to get started, um, another risk some people bring up to me and get nervous about, we already talked about salmonella. One thing actually we didn't talk about was the pH in a dog's system. So in the GI system, it, they're more acidic than ours. Mm -hmm. So it, they, my understanding, and you'll, you'll know better than I, but they are more able and apt biologically to handle any potential harmful pathogens because they are, have a much more acidic uh, GI system than us. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then the same goes for when we're feeding raw, not cooked, um, meaty bones as part of a raw diet or as a topper, one of the number one complaints or not complaints, but concerns I get is, well, my dog's going to choke on that, or my dog's going to try to swallow it whole and it's just going to sit in their stomach and cause uh, a blockage. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if you've never fed whole bones to your dog, you want to start very carefully. And there are, we actually have a course on that, that Dr. Nick Thompson was, was good enough to put together on Dr. Judy Yu um, on how to get started feeding raw meaty bones. So there are different sizes of bones. There's different shapes of bones. There's different toughness of bones. Um, and you have to feed a bone that is appropriate for your size dog. But what I would say to people who are in the early stages of starting to feed raw, buy products that have ground bone. Yeah. That way it's going to be small and you don't have to worry about them choking on it. Yeah. So that will actually take us into how do we start getting, how do we get started into feeding raw? Like what, what are, what are kind of the first steps? And like I said before, we have a full guide link below for you completely free to check out, but to kind of talk through it, Dr. Judy, like, okay, I'm I pretend I don't know what raw is, but I, I, <laughs> I believe you. I'm like all in, I want to feed my dog the best. What's kind of step one for you? So step one, when I started my dogs on raw food, long time ago, um, I bought a pre-made raw food from a very reputable company. And there weren't very many around at that time. So it happened to be um, Dr. Ian Billinghurst from Australia. He had the BARF diet, which stands for Biologically Appropriate Raw Food um, here in the US. And so I started ordering that. It was an easy way for me to get started. And I didn't have to worry about, was it balanced? Was it complete? Am I feeding it right? How, you know, what do I need to do? Um, so I I didn't start with here, have a chicken back or have a chicken neck. I started with, hey, somebody else figured this out for me. I don't know anything about this, but I'm going to try and see how my dogs do. Well, my dogs did great. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say, and I saw somebody say this in the, um, in the chat, that some dogs will not eat raw food. My mother's dog was one of them, and the newest dog that we just adopted is another one of them. The reason being, if they've eaten kibble their whole life, and we have this problem with cats as well, if they've eaten kibble their whole life, what they recognize as food is a hard, dry, brittle nugget. And what we are putting in front of them is high moisture, kind of sticky, slimy feeling. Um, it may smell better, but it's a totally different texture. And so for some dogs, I've even taken it and put it in their mouth. And I'd like the new dog that we have, I gave him a raw chicken heart the other day. He went, 
<laughs> not having any parts of it. Um, so there are going to be some who don't recognize the texture. Um, luckily, my dogs, when I started them on it originally and I got a pre-made food, they were like, oh, cool, yum, great, all over it. Uh, so they made it really easy for me. Um, over the years, I then learned how to balance my own diets, how to have a lot of fun. I have so much fun with my dog's food. Um, I just going through my refrigerator and my freezer and my garden and saying, what looks good today? What, what things do I want to mix together? Um, so the easiest way is really to get something from a reputable company and, you know, start feeding a little bit of it and see if your dog likes it. One thing I will say is that uh, you need to feed the food warm. It has to be room temperature. If you think about how your dog would eat, let's say he went out and he caught a rabbit, he's going to eat it right away. It's going to be body temperature. It's going to be warm. When you take food out of the freezer or the refrigerator, one, it's a shock to the system. So Europeans are, and, and Asians are very smart. They don't use ice cubes in their drinks. They don't drink cold drinks because that is very bad for digestion. So the same goes for our dogs. Do not feed things cold. So if you make raw food or you buy prepared raw food, thaw it out in your refrigerator. And then before you serve it, you've got to get it up to at least room temperature, if not body temperature, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, but we don't want to have a shock to the system. We don't want to cause stagnation and all kinds of problems with digestion. So, uh, so that's how I got started with my dogs. Now, do you want me to talk about how to get started on bones? Yeah, I would love a that. A little bit? Okay. Yeah. So we have some dogs who are complete gulpers. Now, a raw bone is going to digest because the acid in the stomach is going to break it down and it's, it's going to get processed, you know, with the motion of the stomach and everything that goes on with digestive <clears throat> enzymes. So it is going to break down. However, not really a great idea to have your dog swallow an entire turkey neck. So you want to start with something that is appropriately sized for your dog. Now for my guys, um, and weight bearing bones can be uh, a little harder, particularly for smaller dogs, but you, you want to be worried that they're not going to crack teeth. So you also have to know, is your dog an aggressive chewer or is your dog, um, you know, going to take their time with it? So a good thing to start with is a chicken, turkey, or duck neck, depending on the size of your dog, because you can hang on to one end and they can uh, 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 on the other end. And that gives you a chance to see how they are going to be. Are they trying to grab that out of your hand and gulp it? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to learn to actually take their time and chew that? A lot of people will start with chicken backs because we've got the ribs and the spine. And so that's not a huge bone. If they were to gulp, it's going to break down pretty easily. So we find a lot of people start with something like that and uh, frames of... Um, poultry because that's a little bit easier mm -hmm. um so it it just kind of depends on your dog now for my guys if i give them a weight bearing bone so that would be like a piece of femur um then that's i get small ones and my dogs don't eat those bones my dogs aren't big enough to actually eat the bone but they have a really good time pulling the the meat off of it, pulling any tendons that are on there, getting the cartilage off. Um, if it's the end, uh, a lot of, uh, another thing that I really like to start with is oxtail. Oxtail is really good because it's got a hard cartilage with a little bit of bone in the middle, but a lot of meat around it. So that can be a really good way for them to start learning as well. Yeah. I love the idea of holding the bone as they learn how to chew. I remember when my, my, my mom got a, a puppy and at like nine weeks old, we had little raw chicken feet, uh, raw chicken wings and we'd hold it, you know, and just yep. let him gnaw on it. And he loved it. It was the best thing for his teething. Sometimes we would freeze it just to kind of help massage the gums. Um, and now I can give him a bone. He just, he knows to chew it. He knows to yep. tear it apart, cleans his teeth. And it's yep. one thing that, I didn't realize until I started feeding raw bones is how enriching it is for our dogs. It's a really natural activity. That's so what they're meant to do. Yeah. And so <laughs> after they eat a bone, like my dogs, they're, whether it's uh, one that they're chewing on or one that they're actually consuming, they get mentally tired afterwards, almost like we just did a brain game and they're so <laughs> satisfied. So I really love doing that, but I love your point of, of those just getting started. I made a little graphic here. There's kind of a couple different ways you can get started. You can you can start by just adding some raw foods to the bowl or even fresh foods, right? Like you could think mm -hmm. about um, 
a couple fresh food ideas, maybe some uh, wild organic blueberries or raw goat milk, raw goat kefir, uh, green lip mussel. The thing with produce for me, preference, and I know I know you're similar, is to make sure it's either smashed or fermented, mm-hmm. or or lightly steamed if it's a if vegetable. So it's actually actually broken down the cellular walls to make sure the dogs can actually uh, digest the nutrients from it. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of doing that as toppers? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, I have a lot of toppers that I love. So canned pumpkin is a great one that, cause that's yeah. already been pureed and processed. Mm-hmm. Um, not pumpkin pie mix, pumpkin, uh, blueberries and fresh you know, organic fruits, no grapes, no raisins, but otherwise those are great for them. I love, uh, sardines. They're nice and soft. It's got little tiny bones in there. So you're getting some calcium. Most dogs absolutely love them. Great source of omega threes. Um, I usually buy the sardines in water. You could get the ones in oil and still be fine. Um, I use a lot of steamed or sauteed mushrooms. I love mushrooms sauteed in uh, coconut oil. And then for plant material, you can feed it steamed or you can run it through your food processor. But dogs don't have as much of the enzyme cellulase, which breaks down the cell wall of plant material. So they're not as good at breaking that down. They can do it, but they're not as good. So if we process it, the veggies in some way for them, whether that's pureeing them, steaming them, chopping them up real fine. Um, That is going to help them actually get those nutrients out. And we actually have uh, some really good studies that show that like dark leafy greens, they actually are more nutritious after they're steamed than they are uh, raw. Yep. Uh, we, we get more nutrition out of them. That's human as well as pet. So um, don't be afraid of that. So if you're making, let's say you're steaming broccoli for dinner for yourself, save some, give it to your dog, throw it on top of his food. He might like it. He might not, not like it. You got to try different things and see what they like. Um, there's an old myth, which I may even have, oops, in my first book from Needles to Natural. Um, There's an old myth that you can't feed raw and kibble in the same bowl because they digest at different rates and you'll screw things up Mm. and blah, blah, blah. That's not true. (laughs) So (laughs) you can add some pre-made raw or some, you know, if you're having chicken for dinner and you want to put a little chicken breast raw or cooked on top of the, the, the food, feel free. Um, Don't go heavy on the skin and don't ever use the grease drippings from any cooked meats on your dog's food. Um, That's a surefire way to get pancreatitis. Uh, Pancreatitis is an inflammatory problem, not, it's another whole segment, but it is not really related to feeding too many fats. You can feed a very high fat meal. It's related to cooked fats that are now rancid um, and cause a lot of inflammation in the body. So no drippings, no bacon drippings, no, and I would highly recommend not feeding your dogs bacon, sausage, and ham. Pork is fine, like uh, pork tenderloin. Um, that's nice and lean. That's great. Uh, but the ones that have nitrates in them or been smoked are not as good. Yeah, I agree. And so for for me, when I first started getting uh, started in feeding raw, I began just by adding raw meat to the bowl of kibble. Um, sometimes I did it separately. Sometimes I did it with the meal just to get my dogs used to it. Because at that time I was still repulsed by (laughs) feeding my dogs raw meat. I was like, what is going on? But I just gave little bits of that. Um, and it helped with the transition process, which we could talk about transitioning here in just a moment. Um, but then, then that, then I went to a commercially available raw and have a picture here, um, of a freezer section, uh, in a pet store. And so when we say commercially available or pre-made raw. This is what we mean. Like you go to your local independent pet store, um, or you can order online now, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you'll go to the freezer section or it'll be delivered to you on dry ice in a box, um, when you order it. And, uh, it comes to you, like Dr. Judy said, complete and balanced, most of them, right. But they come to you complete and balanced. It comes a lot of times in like a hamburger patty form frozen, you defrost it in the fridge and then you feed it as is. And you can feed this with kibble. So you could remove, you know, 10 to 20% of the bowl of kibble, replace it with some of that raw food just to give them some of that fresh density. Uh, or you could feed it as a complete meal. Um, 
do you have any tips of certain things that you specifically look for or avoid in looking for a pre-made raw? I want them to be very honest about is this human grade meat that is going into, well, human grade ingredients, period, going into the product. Because just like there are kibble manufacturers who use really nasty meats from animals that have died of God knows what, uh, there are some unscrupulous raw food companies who will also do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely look for uh, whether or not they've had recalls. And you can do that either on the FDA website or you can do that on uh, truthaboutpetfood.com, which is Susan Thixton's uh, website. Um, so you want to know, have they had recalls? And I'm also looking for raw food that is made using all whole food ingredients without a bunch of vitamins and minerals. Because if they're still having to add back in that vitamin mineral mix, almost all vitamin mineral mixes come in from China. And there's very little quality control. And that's why we have these massive recalls, like when the vitamin D levels were so high and so many animals died of kidney failure from the excess vitamin D. So again, the body will pick and choose what it needs from whole foods. It has no choice when you slam it with an overdose of synthetics. Um, so when I'm reading the label, I'm, I'm looking for that as well. And there's a couple of different kinds of pre-made raw. There are what we call prey model, which don't contain fruits and veggies. So it's gonna be meat, bone, and organ. Um, and then there is more the whole raw model and that's where I am. So I look for about 20% fruits and veggies in there. And if I'm making my own, that's about where I'm falling. And they're not starchy veggies. They're things like the dark leafy greens. Uh, I'm fine with carrots. I'm fine with butternut squash. Um, I use sweet potato occasionally. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Like look for real foods on the, on the label and look for human grade. And if you want organic, there are companies out there that source only all organic. You're definitely going to pay more, but it is available. Yeah. Um, so what about, what are you, we don't need to deep dive it, but what's your opinion or preference on HPP versus non HPP? And, and for those watching HPP is high pressure processing or pesterization. So it's this, yeah. an additional step of processing. Yeah. So, I mean, it is one additional step of processing and does it break down and denature the proteins a little bit? Probably. Um, I don't think we have great studies on it, but a lot of these companies, their back is up against a wall because, and there are different ways, different processes that can be done. Some use sort of a, a microwaving process. That's not an actual cooking process. Some use the high pressure pasteurization. Some are using what we call bacteriophages, which are basically organisms that eat bacteria. Um, but it's, it all comes because FDA has a zero tolerance policy on bacteria in raw pet food because it is supposed to be fed raw and it's not going to go through a cooking or kill step. So when we use these microwaving or HPP or phage processes or fermentation is another good way to get over this hump so that you don't have a uh, bacterial contamination in the food. Um, it, it's, again, it's uh, being driven by money um, and who's, who's kind of driving the rules here uh, because the chicken that you buy in the grocery store about 70% of it is contaminated with bacteria. That's why you're told to cook your chicken to such a high heat hamburger, anything kind of ground meat, very highly contaminated because it's got more surface area. It's been more, it went through that grinding step. So it's more processed. Um, so the um, USDA uh, oversees meat in the grocery stores. They allow that contamination because it is assumed that you will cook the meat but you have that raw chicken on your kitchen counter, on your cutting board, on your utensils, on your hands. Um, so it's a little bit of a, it's a game. Uh, so if I can find a process that's not HPP, I prefer it. Uh, I have fed HPP products to my pets and I don't see a huge difference. Um, you know, there's people on both sides of that fence. I, the only thing I would say is I prefer not to have it, but if it's a product that I need for a specific reason, then I would let it prohibit me from getting it. And you may or may not know if the product is HPP, you may have to call the company and ask. 
Yeah. My, my only thought on it, cause I'm, I'm similar is that I would want the cost to reflect that. So if I'm, I've seen a couple raw food brands out there that are HPP and use synthetics and their cost is pretty high. And so my thought is if there's been brands I've seen that have um, tried to lower cost and using the synthetics or help them do that to make it more accessible. I'm kind of like, okay, I can kind of see that, but I, I'm, I'm with you. The, the less processed, the better, but I understand the need for it. And it's not a huge, huge red flag for me. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, you know, getting started feeding raw. You could do it as just a topper. We call it like a hybrid bowl, if you will. And you could do that for your dog's entirety of life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could feed them. There's studies, but Purdue did the study where they showed that by replacing 20% of the bowl with real fresh foods, you could see a decrease in cancer by up to 90% or something like that. Um, and then, or you could feed a commercially available store-bought frozen food. So that's a great way to do it. You don't have to balance it. Or you can DIY or home make your own food, which we did include a free recipe. Um, and I'll put that actually on the screen. We can kind of talk through it in our guide with instructions. These are an ingredients. These are just the ingredients. Um, but this is a great getting started recipe uh, that you can try that you could feed actually cooked or raw, correct? Yes. And so somebody had a great question. They said they have seafood allergies in the house. And mm. that recipe, if you can pop it back up again, yeah. the recipe has sardines in it and it has oysters in it. So the oysters are there. And I understand a lot of people have shellfish allergies. So that's a huge red flag. The oysters are there to provide zinc. We find so many diets are way too low in zinc. Zinc is critically important for skin and coat health and also for seniors. Seniors are, are, are very commonly low in zinc. So you could place the oysters in there with a 15 milligram zinc capsule. There's also a zinc liquid called Vimergy, V-I-M-E-R-G-Y, that you could use in place of those oysters. Everything that is in that, that diet has a lot of ingredients because we need that many ingredients if we are going to not use anything synthetic. So like turmeric, it, we have that in there for manganese, which is critically important for the cruciate ligament. Uh, we have kelp in there. That's for the iodine, critically important for thyroid function. We have a little bit of sea salt in there, which is at the same level as what you would find in your blood. Sodium and chloride are really important for nerve transmission, cell function. Um, I have sardines in there. It's for um, extra omega-3s. If you really have a seafood problem where you can't even do the sardines, I would say that you could leave that out. We've got cod liver oil in there. Um, we could do a separate uh, vitamin D. Uh, we, I don't even think we need the vitamin A that's in that. Um, but the vitamin D, there are vitamin D supplements available for pets. So if we're using, I like the RX vitamins, uh, vitamin D, three in a recipe that big, you probably only need three drops of the vitamin D supplement. So there are ways around these things. Um, and I only know what replaces what, because I've been doing this for so many years now. Um, so, but there are ways around those things. And what the problem that I see with people who want to do DIY is you start out with a complete recipe and we have a bunch of them on the website. Uh, you start out with a complete recipe and then, oh, I couldn't find that. So I left it out. Oh, that was slimy and I didn't want to deal with it. So I left it out. And then before you know it, you're down to four ingredients and it's totally unbalanced and you're feeding like I had one woman who was feeding her dog um, ground hamburger and broccoli for three years. Uh, and I, so I begged, I begged, I said, could you just add at least some liver? And she came back in a few weeks. And I said, how'd that go? And she said, yeah, I did it once. It's slimy. I'm never touching it again. I'm not doing that. Oh. I said, okay, well, we have a big problem here because <laughs> your dog can't survive on this. <laughs> yeah. So what about feeding amount? So let's say I was, I was, you know, looking at that recipe and I want to just test it out, see how my dog does on it. How do I know how much of that recipe to feed my dog? So I don't know if we gave you the calorie count on that. It doesn't have it on there. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably going to be about 25 calories per ounce is my okay. bet. They're usually coming up 25 to 30 calories per ounce. Um, and dogs need 20 to 30 calories per pound of body weight. Uh, the bigger the dog, the lower that's going to be. The smaller the dog, the higher that's going to be because they tend to be more energetic. And it also depends on do you have an active dog 
or do you have, uh, you know, a couch potato? Um, you can also convert it into two to three percent of body weight. So that and that comes up to twenty to thirty calories per pound. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it work, it work, the math works out pretty easy. Some people don't like to do math. Um, and there are feeding calculators that are available. I don't yeah. know if we have one on our website. There's one in my book, Yin and Yang Nutrition, I know. Okay. And I'll have your book and all your links and everything linked down below, by the way. Um, but I think that that, you know, so, so going, so thinking about DIY, I think some of the most important things are making sure it's balanced, as you said. So using recipes by qualified veterinarians or nutritionists, Dr. Judy being probably the most qualified I know personally. Um, and you have a bunch on your web website. You have a course that goes into great detail on DIY for people who are like next level 2.0 pet parents that just want to take it to the next um, extreme. What are a couple other mistakes that people often make when they're making their own food that you are like, make sure you watch out for this? So we need to add calcium to the diet uh, if you're making your own. Now, if you're feeding raw meaty bones as part of the diet, they're going to get calcium from right. that. Otherwise, it, let's say you're like, okay, great. I'm going to have some chicken. I'm going to have some broccoli. I'm going to you know, get my zinc. I'm going to get my vitamin D, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, always have to have some organ meat in there. At least in my mind, you have to have organ meat. So if you don't like handling them, either wear gloves or buy them freeze dried or something. Um, but if you don't put in a calcium source, the calcium phosphorus ratio is going to be way, way, way off um, because meat is high in phosphorus and low in calcium, and they have a much higher calcium requirement than we do. Uh, so you can use ground eggshell powder and you can make your own or you can buy it. Uh, generally, for every pound of meat in your diet, you're going to need one finely ground eggshell. Uh, which works out to about three quarters of a teaspoon. So we want to make sure we have a calcium source. You can also use bone meal. Again, make sure it's really well sourced bone meal because that's a, a, a contaminant laced disaster on poorly sourced bone meal. Um, you, or you can feed ground bone or uh, have them chew raw meaty bones. If you're um, bone, if you are using bone, whether you're grinding it or letting them chew ground bone or, or chew bone, uh, raw meaty bones. If your bone content's too high, you're going to get constipation issues. So I do find sometimes that when you're switching from a kibble to a raw, if your pet is struggling, even if you're using a pre-made product, um, if they get constipated, add some pumpkin, <laughs> dilute things down a little bit. Um, but sometimes they will because they're just not used to processing that. They're used to processing something totally different. So that's actually a good segue to talking about transitioning. But before I do that question, I saw come in about the recipe. So this is complete and balanced as is. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, if someone was feeding the right amount of that recipe, could they feed that for their dog's entirety? Or would you recommend to rotate? I do not recommend different? ever feeding the same thing, whether you're feeding kibble, uh, DIY, pre-made raw, pre-cooked, don't feed the same thing day in and day out. Yep. If there is a micro deficiency or an excess of something in there, you're over time, it's kind of like the dry kibble where we don't have enough moisture over time. Over time, you will run into problems. So my dogs don't eat the same thing twice in a day they barely eat the same thing twice in a week. Uh, we rotate all different proteins. I, I use a lot of pre-made raw just because I don't have time to make my own all the time. Uh, but I'm using pre-made raw from four different companies right now yep. um, because everybody has differences in their recipes. And then within those companies, I'm using different proteins. So one company has five proteins. Another company has five. Another one... I only feed two of theirs. So, but I'm rotating all the time with my guys. Now, wait, one question before I transition is somebody might say, well, my dog can only eat one thing. And if I have, if I feed them anything else, then they have diarrhea and GI issues. What would you say that typically indicates? Well, there's something... I mean, they may have intolerances to things. They may have leaky gut. So I have my 18 month old puppy who's being very good at the moment. Um, <laughs> he does really well on Turkey yep. and he does really well on Turkey from one specific company. I feed him Turkey from multiple companies. Um, and sometimes I can sneak in some chicken and sometimes I can sneak in some quail. And sometimes that goes South for me. I know that he does not do well on beef. He can eat venison. He cannot eat rabbit. 
So sometimes it's a playing game. You can get testing done, to, but the testing is not as accurate as how your animal reacts when you feed it to them. So I do have one dog who is on more limited proteins. Another thing that I will say is we've fostered and adopted a lot of disaster cases over the years. So Myra was one of our best. She came with bright red elephant skin, infected, nasty, thickened, mm. stunk to high heavens, bladder stones, ear infections. Um, and so I put her on a homemade, she didn't like raw. So I put her on a homemade rabbit stew that, uh, I concocted for her, um, got everything cleared up. I think I also made her a pork stew so that I could use a couple of different things. And within six months, she had a beautiful coat and her skin was cleared up and we got rid of the bladder stones and life was wonderful. And so then I said, well, let's see if she can tolerate other things. So we tried chicken, we tried turkey, we tried beef. Now, when she came, her skin was horrible, clearly had food allergies because it cleared up just by changing her diet. Right. Um, so she couldn't, you know, it could have been the synthetics in the kibble. It could have been, and I know what kibble, she was on a chicken based kibble. So that, I avoided chicken. But after 12 months, I made her chicken, fresh chicken. She tolerated it, no problem. So a lot of times it's just in how it's processed and it food allergies are very rare. I've seen them, but they're very rare. It's usually an intolerance and there's a huge difference. And it's an intolerance because the bowel has been so damaged that they, they just can't deal with it right now. So sometimes once you get everything healed and you get them back to normal, then they can tolerate other things. I've, I've actually seen that numerous times where a dog was eating a kibble and they swore up and down that their dog, and it was true, their dog could not tolerate a kibble that had chicken in it. But as soon as they went to a fresher food diet, either gently cooked or raw, they could absolutely have chicken as long as it yep. was human grade, yep. uh, good quality, because the quality and the type of it also matters. So absolutely. I think that's really fascinating when people say, oh, my dog has a beef allergy. I often wonder in the back of my head, like, I wonder if it's really just the type in the way that it's manufactured. Uh -huh. um, okay, so then let's talk quickly about transitioning. Like, okay, I'm feeding a kibble diet or more processed diet, and I want to start adding toppers or go to a fully raw. What are some tips that you have? Oh, man, nobody likes the way I do it because <laughs> I, I don't have kibble in my house. Yeah. So this dog that we just adopted a couple of months ago, I mean, and he came with all the skin problems and the ear infections and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I knew what kibble he was being fed in the shelter and he was a stray that was picked up. So Lord knows what he was eating before that. Nothing good because the skin was horrible. Um, and so I said, well, I don't have kibble and clearly it's not working for him. Uh, so every dog that comes in my house, even if they come with kibble, the kibble doesn't come in my house. I just, I can't, I can't do it. I just, I know what's in there and I just can't do it. Uh, so I am always the quick change. And a lot of times I'll go to the gently cooked first and move yeah. my way over to the raw because that se seems to be a little bit easier. Um, things that are gently cooked have been partially digested, basically. Uh, so sometimes that makes it easier for the, the dog to handle. I would also say put your dog on a really high quality probiotic during the transition. It makes it a lot easier. Um, so if you're nervous about that or your dog is one that is prone and and Plus, I'm a veterinarian. If my dog breaks with diarrhea, I'm not going to go nuts and I'm not going to put them on metronidazole. And I'm, I'm going to look at it and go, oh, OK, maybe I need some pumpkin. Maybe I need some slippery elm. Maybe I need some clay. I'm going to treat that naturally and I'm not going to freak out. Um, and sometimes the dogs do go through a detox period where it's like, oh, my gosh, I, I've got fresh stuff in here. I got to get rid of all this other stuff. Um, so it, unless the diarrhea is really protracted or you're getting a lot of blood, I, I don't get freaked out. It's like, oh, you're detoxing for a couple of days. That's fine. Um, but if you're more nervous about that, then add, take 25% of your kibble out, add 25% of the, the new food. Um, do that for half a week or a week, then go to 50% and then 75, 25, and then done. Yeah. Um, it, it, it works 99%. And I, I can just say that I, in all the dogs that we have transitioned, all the foster dogs, all the new adoptions, I've never had anybody break with a diarrhea. I, I don't know whether it's just dumb luck um, or if I just have the mindset of, yeah, it's going to be fine. 
Yeah. I, no, <laughs> my, I, it's funny you say that. Cause when I, when I transitioned my Labrador, this was like probably six or seven years ago uh, to a raw diet, I was so paranoid and worried. And of course he had diarrhea and he just was shedding all these, I guess, toxins out. But what really helped me was feeding him a little bit higher raw bone content as part of it. Yes. And that, as you alluded to before, bulked up his stool really quickly and he loved it. So that was a win-win. That was really, really helpful for me. Um, and we even have in the guide that's linked down below for those of you watching the two processes that Dr. Judy's just explained, kind of the cold turkey or the gradual, gradual approach. Um, and then, so kind of going back to the different options that we have for, if you're thinking about feeding a raw, fresh food, we have, like I said, our hybrid diet go with pre-made. Uh, and then we have DIY that you can, you can make it on your own. And with the DIY, it doesn't have to be raw. You can even make cooked DIY, mm -hmm. which I think is, is really beneficial. Um, and just so don't cook bones. Yeah, just definitely. Your definitely. Bones. So you're going to use with that, you're going to use the eggshell calcium or bone meal. Um, somebody said, if I feed my dog raw meat with fruits and veggies, do I still need to give them vitamins or supplements? Yeah, you've got to find your cow. If you're just feeding, it depends whether you have bone in there. Um, but the, you're getting zinc. You're only going to get that from oysters, mussels. Um, you can get some from wheatgrass. Uh, so some the manganese, it, turmeric uh, is a good source of that. Um, so yes, you're, if you're going DIY, you're probably going to need some supplements to help balance things out. And there are supplements that are specifically made for balancing homemade diets. Um, but even some of those that are specifically made, like we have one that we've been using for years and years as a mineral supplement, it doesn't have any zinc in it. Mm. So it's like, okay, well, great. I still need to find a zinc source. <laughs> so, you know, whether, like I said, whether you use a zinc capsule or the Vimergy liquid. Um, so yes, we, we do. If you want to DIY, you're going to have to educate yourself. You're going to have to figure out and not that every single meal every day has to be hundred percent complete and balanced, but over the period of about a seven day, you better make sure that you've got everything that they need in there. Because if they are chronically low on manganese, you're going to blow cruciates. If they're chronically low in zinc, you're going to have a lot of coat problems. So if you're chronically low in vitamin D, those dogs are prone to cancer, heart disease, joint disease, brain disease. <laughs> so, um, and you don't want to use human supplements. Um, well, the 15 milligram zinc capsules are pretty much going to be human. Um, but don't, never use a human vitamin D. They're way too strong. You'll kill your dog. Um, so can you freeze pre-made? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think that's why for me, at least when I have a lot of newbies really interested in feeding a raw or again, fresher option, I'm really bullish on start with toppers and, or start with a pre-made raw, get really comfortable with that, really understand what's in that food. And then you can start if you want exploring DIY. And the reason I like sharing your recipes, Dr. Judy is now, especially I feel like there's so many people coming out uh, on social media with all these recipes that they can do. But the, the problem is, is, is what you're explaining. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of, well, that's slimy. So I don't want to feed that. And it can lead to a lot of um, imbalances. And so I like the fact that you have not only recipes available, many of them are free, uh, which we include in our guide in the link below, but you also have so many resources to back up and help in your online answering questions all the time. So you just have so much to go with it because I do believe that if you are going to make your own dogs, your own, your own dog's food, that you, you do need to kind of be that next level, really educate yourself, really take the time to understand what you're feeding. Cause it can be harmful. Yeah. And somebody wants to know if, is there a recipe that is cat and dog friendly? There's a reason cat recipes are different from dog recipes. They have different requirements. Um, we do have a recipe for homemade cat food on our, I think we have a couple of recipes for homemade cat food on the website. Yeah, they are I'll different from dogs. To, yeah. I'll try to go search those and link them for you guys below as well. So I think with all that, are there any missing components of starting to introduce raw dog foods that we haven't covered that you're really passionate about? <sighs> The only thing, I, you know, I was one of those people way back 20 years ago, whatever it was, when I started feeding raw, when I was a holistic, well, I was becoming a holistic veterinarian, so I was very integrated. Um, and when people came to me about feeding raw to their dogs and asking me questions, I believed the hype. And I would tell people, oh, no, you know, we got to worry about the bacteria. And then mm -hmm. I educated myself 
and found a quality, you know, pre-made food to start with, I've never looked back. Do my dogs sometimes get gently cooked? Yes. They're gently cooked is when I feel like making food and I feel like cooking it, but I don't even bother with that step most of the time. Like, like I said, the new, new guy we have, he won't eat it raw. His is gently, but I'm taking a raw food, a complete raw food, and I'm cooking it for him. There you go. So, um, special treatment there. <laughs> yeah, a little bugger. Uh, and some dogs will not do well on raw. Um, some of the really, like I have a little English toy. She's very irpy burpy. Um, and so she can't tolerate beef. She can't tolerate heavy things that are slow to digest. And so we started offering her the gently cooked that we're offering the other guy to see if it would help. And it has helped her with her irpiness. Um, so for some of them, your transition period might be a little longer. and You might need every pet is an individual and you have to listen to what they're telling you. If they're being, if you switch to raw and they're kind of irpy, maybe you need to just take the edge off it a little bit, gently cook it a tiny bit and see if you can work your way over a little bit. Um, so they're, they're all going to be individuals, but I would strongly recommend giving it a try because we just have so much evidence. Dr. Connor Brady's book, Feeding Dogs, talks about the difference between raw versus kibble feeding and all this. He's a science nerd and he talks about so many studies. And once you read that, you're like, how, how could I possibly not feed raw? Yeah, we actually go. Sense. We actually go live with him tomorrow, so that will be linked down below. Yeah, he'll oh, he's one of my on. favorite people. He's. Fun. I know he's he's incredible, and I learned about him through you. Like you have, you literally, <laughs> you've changed everything for me, Dr. Judy. I'm I'm such a fan. I'm so grateful for your time. Um, and I think with that, I think um, I think that's all I really have to cover. I think you know my biggest takeaway here is just what you said. Every dog is different. Nobody knows your dog better than you. And if you are one of those pet parents where you really want to do this, but but your veterinarian is hardcore against it. And you're just, and I understand like it's hard to go against somebody that you respect so much. I personally think it's okay to get a second vet opinion and you can go to AHVMA, the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association.org. And it'll list a bunch of holistic or integrative veterinarians that will likely be more aligned with what you're looking for if you want to find a veterinarian. And there's a lot that are doing online consultant mm -hmm. work as well. So there are options for you to find a vet that aligns with what you're looking to do. So you, you don't have to be alone in this. You can also follow Dr. Judy Morgan. Everything will be linked down below because she will, from afar, digitally guide you and, and work with you um, through all the content that she shares. So definitely please follow her. Um, she's an inspiration to hundreds of thousands of us. So thank you so much for being on today. And for everyone Thanks. watching, please make sure that you 